Welcome back to the Industry 4.0 and Sustainable Supply Chain Stage here at COGX. I hope you all enjoyed yesterday's sessions as much as I did. I am Katz Keeley, CEO of Beep and founder of Frontline Live, and I'm your MC for this stage for the next couple of days. In a second, I will hand you over to the fabulous Jeremy Silver, who will be leading a super interesting conversation. We've all been talking about digital transformation for a very long time, but COVID has really sharpened our focus. And what does that mean? Why is it really important? The need has really, really accelerated. So where are we now? How will COVID impact the next phase of Industry 4.0? Will industry be able to adapt their businesses model in time to survive and thrive? Massive pleasure to hand you over to Jeremy Silver, CEO of Digital Catapult. Thanks very much, Katz, and uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to this uh, Industry 4.0 uh, and Sustainable Supply Chain stage. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to welcome two uh, terrific uh, uh, conversational partners uh, this morning to this session. Um, we're going to explore uh, the implications of Industry 4.0 following COVID, but uh, we're going to really drill into what Industry 4.0 itself is, 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 has as in the way of potential. Um, but uh, to leap straight into this, uh, let me introduce you first to uh, Jürgen Meyer, Professor Jürgen Meyer, I should say, um, who is uh, the former CEO of uh, Siemens UK, um, and as far as I'm concerned, much more importantly, is also the chairman uh, of the Digital Catapult Board. So he's my boss, so I have to watch my P's and Q's this morning. Um, but um, during the course of uh, the last uh, two years, Jürgen has really developed his uh, personal passion for Industry 4.0 and taken that uh, with the development of industrial strategy in the UK uh, into the formation of a program called Made Smarter, uh, which many of you will be familiar with. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Um, but before we do that, let me also uh, welcome our fellow guest, uh, Hayatun Silem, uh, uh, Dr. Hayatun Silem. I should try and get everyone's titles this morning. Uh, Hayatun is uh, the chief executive of the Royal Academy for Engineering. Uh, and is so uh, involved very deeply both in the, the future progress uh, of engineering as a, as a sector in the UK, uh, but also in the, in the skills uh, and the training needs that, that, uh, that underpin that going forward. Uh, and uh, Hayatun previously served as a committee specialist and uh, as a special advisor to the head of the, the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee. So she is no stranger uh, to, to leading discussions uh, and formulating uh, ideas and policy uh, at, a, at a national, if not a, a global level. Um, I, I think uh, we're going to um, try to do this as a kind of three-way conversation. So I, I, I'm going to throw a few questions in, but, but I might have the odd opinion to express as well. Um, but we'll see how that works as a, as a format. You may not have seen this format um, used anywhere else, and there may turn out to be a reason for that. On the other hand, it may be that we can do this successfully and, uh, and hopefully engage you all in the process um, as, as we work through some of the ideas and the thoughts um, and, and some of the possibilities that, that extend out uh, uh, from Industry 4.0 post, 4.0, not post COVID. Um, but first, I think it would be worth just uh, uh, reeling back slightly, and, and Jürgen, maybe I can turn to you first and just ask you to give us a sense of, first of all, you know, what your your vision of Industry 4.0 and, and, and what is it about 4.0 as, as an industrial uh, revolution, uh, if I can be so bold as to call it that, uh, that, that uh, has captured you and has, has made you so passionate about this? Yeah, thank you, uh, Jeremy, and uh, well, great to be um, the the conversation partner, as you put it. I think it's a very good idea, Jeremy, with uh, with Hayatun uh, and yourself this morning on this uh, on this very important topic of the fourth industrial revolution, what we've called made smarter, and uh, um, and and obviously it's it's brilliant to 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 be talking with you because you were part, both of you were part of the journey when we started this many years ago, actually. Um, when we were beginning to get some evidence um, that in the UK, 
companies in the manufacturing sector, but it also goes into other sectors too, but we focused on manufacturing, um, were not adopting digital technologies at the pace that some other industrialized nations were. And of course, we weren't comparing ourselves to the average, we were comparing ourselves to the best. Um, what was happening in, uh, in, in Singapore, very good things happening in Germany. Um, surprisingly, some other countries, you know, we were quite interested that were some really good things happening in places uh, in, uh, in, in Slovenia and, uh, and Serbia and places like that. So, so that was the starting point. How do we get people to embrace this industrial re uh, digital revolution more? The reason, of course, is, is because um, it is clear that if you do adopt digital technologies, um, your productivities go up, your competitiveness goes up, and therefore you can export more and you can create more, more value for the British economy and, uh, and, and, and more jobs. Um, so, so that's why we set about uh, the activity. Then two years ago, we launched Made Smarter. Made Smarter um, has got sort of three core elements uh, uh, in it. One was all about the creating the digital technologies that we want um, companies to adopt more. So here we're talking about things like additive manufacturing, robotics, talking about the better use of data. That's a huge one, of course. You know, how do you better use all the data in factories of the product design? How do you optimize design and manufacturing uh, uh, processes? So that was the first part of it, the creation of those technologies. The second bit then is about the adoption of those technologies. And, uh, and we've got a very successful pilot going now in the northwest of England, where through grants and technology support, um, we're able to help small companies adopt these sorts of technologies at a faster pace, and we're making progress on that. And then the third key element is all about skills, um, and is about, especially about upskilling existing workforces to be more comfortable um, with these types of uh, technologies. So those are the things we've been working on. Um, and, you know, we've made success. Um, but I think um, we're at a point where uh, we need to reflect and decide whether that's been fast enough or whether we, uh, we really need to hit the accelerate button. And it, I mean, it is interesting, the, the degree of complexity involved in this. I mean, the, the, the number of different aspects of, of, of industrial work uh, and different areas of process all the way through uh, the value chain, really, from the from the earliest stages of, of, of product design, through processing, right through to the, the sort of the, the consumer, the end user experience at the other end. Uh, hi, Tim. Maybe, maybe I should ask you. What, I mean, when you first kind of, I don't know when you first kind of came across the phrase industrial industry 4.0, but I just wonder what you know. Is there is there a particular aspect of all of those, given that sort of complexity, all those different points of entry, as it were? Was there sort of one aspect of it in particular that kind of initially kind of excited you or caught your imagination? Yes, um, that's a good question. So I guess I first became aware of Industry 4.0 when uh, Henning Kargerman, who was one of the architects of the German Industry 4.0 that we, we still refer to, where it's become part of common parlance, um, spoke at the Academy several years ago now. It was at the very early stages. And one of the things that just struck me um, was the fact that he said, Industry 4.0 must be a human centric revolution. And when you think about industrial digitalization, that's not necessarily the mental image that springs to mind. But for me, that was very, very profound. And it resonated with some of the issues and, and um, priorities that, that, that I shared personally, that we share at the Academy. Um, I think you know the UK has this wonderful tradition and strength in um, emerging technology, in the underpinning discovery research, in the development of groundbreaking innovation. Um, and that tends to be the bit that we get excited about. I get excited too, I find it thrilling. But we see, seem to have less emphasis on how we encourage the uptake, the fusion, the adoption of technology, of innovation across our wider industrial base to the point where it is adopted at scale, where it's being deployed at scale. And the problem with that overemphasis on the sort of the earlier part of the spectrum is that actually the way that people experience, the way people actually feel benefit from these groundbreaking discoveries is through getting these technologies deployed at scale across companies, across the public sector. And so Industry 4.0 is very much 
about thinking um, thinking about technological disruption as part of an ecosystem. And every time we think about disruption, of course, there's also the possibility for that disruption to provide a new window of opportunity to drive positive change. But that's also an opportunity if we're not careful, if we're not conscious in the way that we uh, steward that process, um, then that disruption can re reinforce inequality. And of course, what we want to do is for something like Industry 4.0 for this wave of technological change, waves of technological change that we're living through, we want that to be something that reduces inequality. So for all those reasons, I was really delighted to come on board with the Made Smarter Commission and prior to that, to get involved in Jürgen's review. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it was an extraordinary uh, experience to go through. Um, and, and I think it's, I don't know whether it's been documented, uh, but actually I, I, it is such a textbook case of how to galvanize an industry. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. at that height, Jürgen, of, of this, you, you had about 400 companies uh, actively engaged in, in developing the program in, 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 in across working groups and across the, the, the different areas of technology that have been identified and different mm -hmm. industrial sectors that have been identified. And uh, I mean, that's an incredible achievement to sort of bring that huge swathe of, of what is you know, quite a diverse group uh, together and, and not just at the very top uh, top tier, although obviously the tier one companies you know, have a huge role to play in both uh, you know, advocating the, the innovation themselves, but also bringing their own supply chains along. I, I, you know, I suppose that the question is, how easy do you think it, it is? Uh, and, and what are the, how do we go about trying to sustain that level of momentum? Because I think it has been sustained for quite some time. Obviously, COVID has put a huge, big kind of pause button on everything for, uh, temporarily. But uh, I mean, before we get to that, uh, was, was there a sense that you had that this was um, you know, rolling out uh, uh, you know, across that breadth of, of, of business opportunity? Yeah, I mean, just a couple of things to say to that. So first of all, yes, it has been, um, you know, really heartening, actually, to see the level of enthusiasm by which uh, the manufacturing sector has embraced this. Um, what's also uh, great to see, and of course, this is where, you know, we, me, you, uh, me and you, Jeremy, uh, um, with our digital catapult activities really come in, is we are also beginning to see many more startup companies engaging um, with the ecosystem. So it's not just the, the manufacturers of today, it's the new technology companies that are getting engaged and helping in technology areas like augmented uh, reality, for example. So, so that's been really great to, uh, to, to see that. Uh, and, and we have now got many thousands of companies engaged up and down, uh, and down the country. You do raise a very good point, though, about you know, how do you keep the enthusiasm and the motivation going, especially in a time like now, where of course we're going through this this COVID crisis, and I'd say there's two things there. One is COVID has definitely put a spotlight on the fact that digital technologies are an enabler to help you get through crises like this, and I'm sure we'll yeah. come back to talk about that. But on the other hand, you, know, you you have to go into the fourth industrial revolution with a mindset for the long term and with a mindset to invest in skills, to invest in technology. You know, and and at the moment, a lot of people are going to be thinking about just how do I keep my production going today for today's output and not worry about the future. So, so I think that's going to be quite challenging for us. Yes, yes. Hi, Tim. Do, do, I mean, from your perspective, obviously, you've taken a great interest in the the kind of the reskilling side of things in particular. Um, I mean, one has the feeling at the moment that that you know, so much of activity in that area has also had to be put on hold, but how would you, how do you see that uh, in terms of the sort of the importance of of all of these different mm -hmm. and we've talked about these sort of three different areas the, the innovation the, the the adoption and and, and the skills piece um just tell us a little bit yeah. more about the way that you see the skills piece playing out in this yeah well, well jeremy you're being very polite and not saying i am obsessed with the skills piece which would be i, I try to be polite i mean you know i don't know how long i've got to keep it up for but i'll, well, I'll let, let's keep trying for now for the sake of the audience. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I just think that, that you know, we, we have to be so focused on skills in the broader sense. Unfortunately, I think, you know, we, we tend to have a slightly linear view of how skills um, development works. And the reality is that, um, we're, you know, as, as the stat is something like 80 percent of the workforce of 2030, whatever precision you attach to that, the vast majority of the workforce of 2030 has already left uh, full-time education. 
And um, we are seeing, a, a, living through a period now of significant um, industrial transformation. And we need to have a much better plan for how we're going to support talent circulation throughout the economy. It cannot be that you, you choose your career when you're 14 or something. Uh, you know, you choose subjects at school that then uh, cut off certain careers from you. And that means that um, you then are sort of on a, on a tram rail for the rest of your life. That's not the reality of the world we live in. So um, I was so thrilled that um, uh, Made Smarter embraced the, the notion of retra retraining, upskilling, reskilling, lifelong learning, whatever you want to call it, as being integral to how we do advance the, um, the, the fourth industrial revolution in the UK. And uh, particularly this time, I would like to give a shout out to Ingenuity, as uh, you probably know the centre, so many people may still remember them as that, who have done a fantastic job working in partnership with a number of others, um, uh, but but who have really driven the creation of a new portal called Engage. And I'd strongly encourage people to take a look. Essentially, what, what it's trying to do is to help people, either individuals or companies, who are conscious of the need to reskill, who want to upgrade their own skills, to, to have a really simple way to navigate what's on offer. Because, you know, it's the Wild West when it comes to lifelong learning. There are so many uh, courses on offer. How do you know what's relevant to you? How do you know what has, um, what's, what's a course that's going to actually give you any enhanced employability? And Engage has got some clever AI sitting behind it. Um, and it's a lot of effort's gone into making it a, a good user interface. And particularly now when lots of companies have people on furlough or employees who just aren't working their full um, quantum of hours, it's a really great time to invest in upskilling and reskilling. And at least there's now something out there that can help you do that. And um, there's free access for a certain limited period. Um, and so please do go and check it out. It's well worth it. Um, you know, upskilling and reskilling is going to be hugely important to our future competitiveness if you look at the economy as a whole. Um, so it's important for individuals, but it's also important for the UK. When you when you look at our track record, we have underinvested both in the public sector and the private sector in upskilling um, over the past uh, decades. So we don't compare favourably to the rest of Europe. We don't compare favourably to com countries like Sim Singapore. And unless we do think about this, I don't think we're going to be a great destination for future investment. And we desperately need that right now. Yes. Yes. I mean, I could go on, but I'm trying to read it in. For you. No, that's that's um, uh, uh, no rant on rant on. But I think you know, the thing is, uh, it is a very interesting moment that we're we're facing where obviously, um, you know, we've seen a variety of different impacts in different sectors that, that COVID has brought and uh, you know, from uh, aviation and automotive that have been almost brought to a standstill, um, compared with some other sectors yeah. that have perhaps been able to, to continue working in, in in more limited ways, but have actually been able to yeah. uh, continue some kind of processing. I, I wonder whether, uh, you know, I mean, the, the famous phrase, of course, is, you know, never waste a good crisis. Yeah, is, this, is this a moment, do you think, when uh, strategically we're going to see businesses across uh, different industrial sectors really making bigger, more decisive, long-term strategic choices that, that have perhaps been put off, uh, perhaps been delayed uh, in, in, in easier times. And, yeah. and actually now that we're facing what is really a, a very you know, scary, tough position for a lot of people in boardrooms across the country, is this the moment when we're going to start to see that shift? And, and you know, what sort of implications do you think yeah. there are to that? How to what? <laughs> That's a huge question. If I if I can just focus initially on the the, the points we were discussing around skills, um, I mean I think that this notion of talent circulation is massively important. And one of the features that I think has been absolutely outstanding about the response of the manufacturing sector at large and enduring at large um, during the COVID crisis has been the level of collaboration, the sense that none of us can do this individually we have to find new new ways of working together whether that's public private whether that's down the supply chain whether that's uh, with your competitors um, there have been really unprecedented levels of collaboration and so if you think about that in the terms in in terms of skills um, then this notion of talent circulation becomes very interesting so we we are clearly um, and very very sadly not least for the individuals whose lives are affected losing people from some of our flagship companies right now. So 
um, you know, week after week, we're seeing um, announcements of job losses. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we can think about creating more of a, a skills ecosystem in at a regional level, at a local level, so that some of those highly experienced people can go and have opportunities to retrain, possibly temporarily, to go and fill the gaps that we have in our science teachers and schools, go and fill gaps in local FE colleges, where again, there's a shortage of people who really understand the reality of the workplace now, um, notwithstanding the excellent work that is being done in FE colleges. Well, um, I, I, we... I, let's let's come back to this because I, I, I'm not going to abandon your, your obsession. You've got one more point you want to make. One more point. Sorry, Go Jeremy. On. And I promise I'll try and behave myself. No, no, no. It's, it's very important stuff. But couldn't we also um, offer those some of those people who are exiting the opportunity to get involved in supporting our SMEs and to, to gain the entrepreneurial skills they might need to go off and start, start new businesses. Actually, there is an opportunity to create new clusters. Silicon Valley has many, many aspects of its success, but one of those is a talent recirculation system that makes sure that you, know, you, can, you can cope with businesses that start, that fail, that expand, that contract. And could we not use this opportunity, this crisis, if you like, to do something really innovative and creative particularly in parts of the UK that are not so well served already. I'll, I'll zip it for a minute. <laughs> no, that's an incredibly powerful, heartfelt plea, but not just heartfelt, I think with, with real substance behind it, because in the midst of such change, and I think what we are talking about is a degree of, of accelerated change, accelerated disruption in the context of all of this. I think those sorts of, of you know, recognition of what the reality is and, and then really positive suggestions about what we can do about it. I think incredibly important in this. Um, let me let me just take it back though, because I, I, I don't want to abandon this, the, you know, I, I've, I've let right into the heart of what I think we're actually facing at the moment. And I, and I you know, I'd really like to hear your thoughts about this, Jürgen, because it seems to me that, um, you know, in some respects, whilst we've all been in lockdown and whilst there's been a sense of suspended animation, the true magnitude of what we're we're actually going to see in terms of the impact in the economy has not been recognised, and we've we've been able to, in a sense, uh, you know, almost put it off till tomorrow. But tomorrow is coming pretty fast, and and the the level of of uh, and the depth of this uh, impact this that we're going to feel, uh, I don't think we can underestimate. Uh, and yet at the same time, we're, we obviously it's very difficult to get a real handle on at this point. I mean, do, what, what's your sense, Jürgen, of, of the conversation that's going on at senior levels within, you know, the strategic thinkers in the industry at this point? What, 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 how do we really make sure that we come out of this as strongly as we possibly can? I mean, obviously, the, 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 the suggestions that, that Hyatun has just made are a really important part of that. But what, what are the other pieces of the picture? Yeah, yeah well, <clears throat> absolutely. We, we are at a critical point and... Uh, uh, and I mean, let me start with the positive and the positive is and building on what Hayatun has been saying is, is that, you know, there is an opportunity um, and the opportunity is to use this moment uh, to really define the sectors that we want to invest in and we want to be the strong part of our economy in 10 years time. Um, and of course, those sectors ought to be the sectors which are uh, particularly renewable, green, low carbon, um, electric vehicles just being one example, but it can also be uh, electric and hybrid uh, uh, flying. Uh, so really defining those sectors that we want to excel as <clears throat> and then transitioning our economy from the sectors which are going to sadly decline. Um, into those new ones. And as Hayatun rightly put it, that's going to take a massive shift, both technologically, but as importantly, and probably more importantly, in terms of the huge retraining effort. So it is possible. The, the, the issue is, 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 is that as a country, we have not been brilliant at this. I mean, we completely messed this up from the second to the third industrial revolution. We, we let our second industrial revolution uh, industries uh, die, coal, for good reason, and in hindsight, for very good reason. But we did very little to, to prepare the nation uh, for what, what to come, apart from, say, we're going to be a service nation. Uh, and of course, you know, we know what happened is, you know, lots of low paid service jobs ended up in the northern regions, which is where we are today, which is not good enough. So, you know, we really do. Your word, Jeremy, was strategic thinking. 
And that's what we need right now. This is, this is the time to think deeply strategically about what it is we want to invest in and then really, really set ourselves up strategically to deliver it. And we can do it. Um, but I would say the jury is out. Um, and that's purely because you know, we, we, we've not got a history of getting this particularly mm. right. But my call is, let's get all the leaders from industry and politics together and make sure we don't waste this crisis, as you said. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the, you know, it's, I mean, no one could expect a government that's having to deal with the, 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 a national health crisis as its main focus to, um, to, to, to instantly then be able to come up with a, a plan. And, and I don't think you're suggesting that. But I, I suppose one of the things that's well, interesting... Well, well, sorry, just to come back on that, you know, I yeah. think you do need to be able to do both. You know, I mean, France has been, you know, much faster at coming out and supporting its green automotive industry. You know, those plans are already out there. They've announced today, actually, that they're going to carry on the equivalent of our furlough scheme for a period of another couple of years, but with a view to shifting people's skills from sector to other sector. So, so you know, countries are able to do this. And so we're going to have to learn how to manage the here and now and how to focus into the future. Yeah. Sorry and to I, interrupt. And no, no, not at all. I mean, I think that the thing that's really interesting about this is, is where's, the, where's the push and where's the pull, if you like. So, so in a sense, you know, we know that there's opportunity in a range of technologies. Uh, and when I look at this from a, a sort of a digital catapult perspective, we tend to be thinking about about technology push. We're we're very interested in the opportunities that artificial intelligence, that the use of of, of data and sensors and instrumentalizing factories can achieve. What what are the outputs and the and the opportunities that those bring? How does five G start to make uh, uh, the opportunities in factories to reconfigure production lines more easily? Uh, uh, really, you know, become a reality. How how do you use things like augmented reality to do uh, remote maintenance and, and, and that kind of thing. I, I'm just wondering, you know, do you think that, that is, that's where the pull is going to come from? Or do you think that, that, that in a sense, because we're in such a, a, a challenging situation where the, the level of, uh, uh, of, of crisis facing employers is, uh, and, the, and the economic challenge in the, in the supply chains is so extreme, uh, that actually it's, it's going to be much more of a question of, of, of you know, existential questions for individual companies than whether or not to put an investment in one technology rather rather than another. Python, maybe maybe yeah. you might deep in. Well, I mean, it's very difficult to talk about this at the level of the whole economy. Um, this is you know, this is a very complex situation, but I wholeheartedly agree with Jürgen. We don't have the luxury of saying you either deal with today's crisis or you worry about tomorrow. One of the key words that we're all using all over the place now, uh, along with unprecedented, is the importance of resilience. But what does resilience mean? It means that you know you learn from today's crisis to ensure that you're better equipped to cope with future shocks, shocks that you can't yet define, foresee. And so I think there are some learnings that are already being built into companies. I mean, I think it's astonishing the way we've seen suppliers, um, innovators, regulators pivot on a pinhead to be able to respond to this huge imperative that COVID has created, whether that is about meeting a public health need, whether that's about survival, whether that's about the ability to cope with the new um, social distancing requirements. We have proved to ourselves, I think, that maybe we've almost lacked ambition about what is possible yes. when the driver is strong enough. Yes. And so yes. I don't want to, I don't want to sort of say, oh, isn't that marvellous? This is all jolly good stuff. You know, the reality is it's incredibly tough for people out there, but we cannot lose this opportunity to capture that insight into what is possible and then apply it to how we think about our individual organisations and how we work collaboratively and collectively. Um, so I, I believe that is happening. And I think that, you know, the, the key thing is the stimulus that will have to continue to be provided in some form by government must give us the best chance of building out the good things. It, you know, it can't just be you know, a generic life support system. We have to say, you know, as Jürgen has, has articulated, we have strategic priorities. We believe that, for example, our commitment to net zero is core to our future competitiveness. You know, there's a win-win there because yes, it has sustainability impacts, but it also helps with our economic survival. It helps with our resilience. So, you know, we've done some work within the context of Made Smarter looking at how can, um, you know, incorporating sustainability objectives into Made Smarter 
help with the overall um, objectives of the programme. And you see that the opportunity for industrial digital technologies to um, improve operational efficiencies, to, um, to optimise supply chain management or logistics, to create new business models associated with the circular economy. Those are all the sorts of things that really hit the here and now and the longer term survival. Um, and I think, you know, that, that we really do need to, as you said earlier, not waste this crisis. Right. I mean, it is interesting, isn't it, that, that the years of, of regulatory barriers have fallen mm -hmm. in days, not even weeks, mm -hmm. to this crisis. Um, and and we've seen, you know, this, this massive shift in behaviour that we're all currently experiencing right now because we're all able to communicate using this kind of video conferencing platform. It does signal a kind of cultural barrier that has fallen mm -hmm. in terms of our willingness as a, as a as individuals as business people and consumers to to behave differently and to keep going by adopting new technologies and 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 and, and new ways of working uh, yeah when you when you look across that and you think well of what you see there both in terms of the the, the falling and, and the the willingness to to, to lessen regulatory hurdles and at the same time the willingness of people to adopt more quickly than you ever think possible. I mean, I think it was the CEO of Microsoft who said, you know, we've seen digital transformation in two months that we would expect to see in two years. Where do you, th do you think that there are particular opportunities that are really the sort of right, quick wins, low hanging fruit that we should be going for right away? Um, I mean, the answer is, is, is yes. And I am seeing some evidence, you know, not just, I mean, <clears throat> you know, everybody adopting Zoom and virtual <laughs> meetings like this is, you know, is an obvious example. Um, and actually, it's incredible, isn't it? How, you know, I mean, in my previous company, Siemens, we, we worked hard to introduce this and didn't do a bad job. Uh, but there were real barriers. And it's amazing how overnight those barriers just, just completely disappeared. Um, and in the same way, I have seen some evidence in manufacturing environments um, where, you know, there has been the need for people to do things more, more remotely. I mean, the best example I probably saw was the ventilator challenge, um, which, as, as you know, was uh, a challenge to build ventilators for the NHS in this crisis. And the team of people came together completely virtually, but not just, you know, in a chat like this, but they came together with, with, with a virtual design tool to redesign an existing product. They didn't create a brand new one, it was an existing product. Um, they then created the new production line completely virtually, planned it collaboratively in a team. They then simulated how that product will be built before anybody got onto a shop floor, obviously with good social distancing, uh, to, to, to actually start building the site. So, you know, it has created that sort of, and by the way, all of that was done, you know, within a few weeks. I mean, unbelievable. Um, and, and if we can put that sort of a mindset to any new product that any manufacturer now puts into their manufacturing site, to you know, do away with the paper and do it all virtually, model it, simulate it, plan it virtually. I think it'll be amazing what we see in terms of productivity, in terms of improved quality levels, in terms of time to market. Um, so you know, there are massive opportunities, and I just hope we keep that. We almost keep that crisis mindset um, yes. as we as we continue to develop the fourth industrial revolution. It, it is really interesting, isn't it, that that some of the steps that people um, are needing to take now. Um, simply in order to get back to work. So, you know, creating social distancing within factories and within production lines, um, but also increasing the degree of remote operation that they, they can engage in so that, you, you know, literally don't need to be physically in situ in order to manage things. Uh, increasing the amount of remote maintenance that people are doing. Uh, these are all things that are, are really interesting indicators of future directions of travel as well, aren't they? So there, there is a, a kind of a segue that we could see here where investment in some of those things in the short term now to address our current immediate problems. And obviously, you know, there is a there is a problem with 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 our understanding of social distancing and how long we're going to need to engage in it, uh, which raises questions for investment because we simply don't know whether we're investing for, uh, you know, a year or investing for, for three years. But, but some of those sorts of, of areas, um, like remote maintenance or, or um, uh, the remote, remote operation, uh, those are things that actually will stand companies in good stead if they put them in place anyway. Mm -hmm. And so that's, a, in a sense, gives us a sort of a, a pathway that we can see mm -hmm. of, of areas that would straight away 
allow companies both to improve their current situation and, and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, provide a pathway into the future for future development. Uh, do you, I mean, we've got a couple of questions that have, that have come in and I just wanted to pick up on them because um, we, we actually can have some experience of the audience that's out there with us. Um, and uh, yeah. Sandy, yeah. yes, sorry. Wait, just, add, add you, just before you go into that, if I could just also add, I think that there's, we sometimes underplay the incredible um, level of technological sophistication that is in many parts of our manufacturing base. And I think that there are opportunities to learn from, you know, um, digital twins from the sorts of you know, remote management of supply chain that, that actually in the context of healthcare and in the context of how we grapple, grapple with some of the immediate challenges from COVID as well as you know, thinking about what a more resilient um, uh, healthcare system looks like, we, we could have some, some mutual learning. So better understanding on the enduring side of what, what the healthcare challenges are, but also better feedback loop of, of some of the very sophisticated things that are being done in UK industry right now, going back into how we look at the management of a healthcare system, how we develop new products. Um, and so, you know, I hope that that feedback loop also does become this stronger. A, We're certainly going to try and be part of that. Yes. So there's a need to, to really take learnings across sectors. I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. there, is, there is this tendency of people to work in their own mm -hmm. silos and, and circumstances are, that may be different and parameters may be different. But there's a, there's a lot. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I don't know, do we have processes that allow us to do that? Mm -hmm. like, do we have the fora to do that? Is, is that something Made Smarter could take on, Jürgen, do you think? Yeah, no, I think uh, I think it's a very good idea. So, uh, so, so, yeah, good, good, good that we end up with actions here. Okay, okay. well, we'll take a note of that one. You're, you're giving us homework now, Jeremy. I'm not sure I approve That's of that. Right. I don't know. It just it just happens. What can I say? Yeah. Um, Sankadeep has asked us a question specifically about digitization of construction um, and the adoption of IoT, AI, and computer vision in, in the construction center which, sector, which is a really interesting question given that. Uh, construction is sometimes regarded as, as, as less developed and, and uh, less uh, sophisticated than, than some other industrial sectors. Um, but clearly, the use of, the, of technologies like particularly the Internet of Things um, is something that uh, we've started to see coming into the construction sector. I don't know, do you have any thoughts about that, Jürgen, in terms of uh, yeah. you know, how far that could go and what the implications of that might look like? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not a construction expert, but I mean, the possibilities are huge. And, and of course, it is happening. I mean, you know, all buildings, you know, are now built, obviously, you know, with, with 3D modeling and, uh, you know, and pre-visioned and all those sorts of things. What I don't think is happening as much as that is then turning that truly into the sort of the digital twin. So, so having the digital twin and then from that, you can continue to do all of the maintenance like, of the lifts on the lighting systems, on the heating systems and keep everything up to date and you know there's huge opportunities within that another area which which really does interest me a lot is where you actually start to cross the boundary between manufacturing and construction uh, because you know increasingly uh, construction is actually happening off-site um, you know and it's called off-site build and it's happening quite a lot especially in uh, uh, in in domestic so in housing in buildings we live in where literally you know you can build you know you can design it the the the, the person who's going to own the house can have a you know all right i want my bedroom here my kitchen here i want this sort of a kitchen and then literally it gets built in a factory um and that is happening i mean again it, it europe is leading the way on this but there are um i think three companies in the uk now doing this um and then uh, and then through you know very good manufacturing process you then deliver to site and you and you build very efficiently very quickly and a very sustainable uh, sort of uh, sort of home and uh, so so yeah a lot of opportunity and by the way there is an initiative looking at this which i think the royal academy is involved with i'm not sure it's called digital built britain um, Cambridge University are taking a lead on it and so there is a lot of work but I think the opportunity is vast. Mm. Excellent, now, obviously there's, there's an opportunity there for additive manufacturing as well presumably absolutely. To, absolutely. to create bespoke parts that don't need to be uh, have pieces cut out of them because mm. um, they are built around their own uh, joinings and their own connections. Really interesting. I, I'm going to take this other, there's two other questions that have come in and, I, and, and they're sort of an interestingly linked, I think. Um, and and I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about this. So, so Joe has asked what, what thoughts we've got about in, actually incorporating Industry 4.0 into engineering degrees. So really building it into the curriculum, which uh, I think is a, is a really interesting idea and, then, and what form that might take. And then John has asked a question, which I think in a sense 
picking up on something that you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, Hayatun, around uh, the opportunity for entrepreneurship and for, for, uh, mm -hmm. for startups to kind of engage in this sector. Um, but he's asking the question whether that's something that can be taught mm -hmm. or trained or whether, I suppose the implication is perhaps that it, it somehow it's, it's inbuilt. Some people are more entrepreneurial than others and, you, and that's just innate. So I, don't, I mean, they're, they're sort of, there's definitely a connection between those two questions. Mm -hmm. Hayatin, your thoughts? Thank you. Um, well, yeah, again, really important issues. Um, the Industry 4.0 content of engineering degrees is a topic that we're very interested in at the Academy. We've been doing a kind of audit of what is the digital skills content in um, university degrees uh, as, as currently taught across the UK. And the answer is it's very variable. Um, so we haven't yet got to the state where we can publish that, but what we can see is that it, there isn't a very consistent picture. And what we also know and have heard repeatedly from um, those who are responsible for teaching uh, in universities, and this, the same is true, if not more so, in FE colleges, um, that many of the people who are delivering courses don't themselves have experience of Industry 4.0 in the workplace. Um, and so it's hard for them to be teaching people who perhaps have higher degree, uh, higher levels of digital skills uh, than they do. Um, and one of the things that we do at the Academy and many others also try to do is to facilitate the mobility between the, you know, the real world um, Industry 4.0 environments that are now emerging and um, the, 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 the teaching context. So we support people from uh, industry to come in to investing professorships to universities so students have contact time with um, people who are out there working in industry. And um, similarly, we try and allow people who work in universities to go out and get first-hand experience. So I think that's massively important. I know we're quite tight for time, so I'll keep my answers shortish. And then on entrepreneurship, I think, you know, it's not that you want to convert someone who has no interest in entrepreneurship to being an entrepreneur, but there'll be a subset of people who have, for example, experienced life in a corporate, who actually have the appetite and the aptitude um, to go off and start their own companies. And all that, that that kind of teaching can do is to make sure that they um, build their, their their understanding of the various different dimensions of that. Um, and we've been successfully running enterprise fellowships at the Academy for many years and have lots of great examples of people without a background entrepreneurship going on to play a key role in founding and growing companies. And it's not always about being the CEO. It might be that you're the CTO um, or the CIO, but it's still a valuable contribution. Excellent. Hi, Tim. Thanks so much. That is really interesting. Uh, the, and, and the sense in which, uh, you know, the, a kind of entrepreneurial spirit uh, can exist in uh, both in, in terms of a structured educational environment, but also uh, in the context of startups, I think it is, is key to this. Um, we're, we're very nearly out of time, guys. So um, first of all, just to, to, a message to you viewers. Um, hope you've been enjoying this conversation. And if you've got more questions to ask, um, we are going into a Q&A session at 11 o'clock. Um, so do push those questions into Sligo, however you'd like to express them. And however um, elementary you may think those questions are, we'd be, we'd be fascinated to see. And, um, you know, the simplest questions can sometimes produce the most complicated answers. Um, one minute each of you before we close. Um, uh, Hyatton. Where, where do we go from here? What are, what are the real priorities coming out of COVID that we need as a, as a country and, and perhaps as, as from, a, from a message to the government in terms of what might it sorts of programmes might it put in place to, to really kickstart the recovery? Thank you. That's a really easy question to answer in one minute, Jeremy. Um, I would actually like to just use the opportunity to say I haven't spoken explicitly about diversity. And whilst I've talked about inequality, I think that you know we really have to make a conscious decision as a country about the sort of industry we want to have and where we want the benefits of it to be felt. So we need to have this lens of diversity and inclusion, and that's at the level of geography as well as at the level of gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic background. Um, so we need to keep that <coughs> in front of our minds. And I'm not going to attempt to answer the bigger question because I don't think I can in the time available. So sorry for copping out. No, no. Well, I mean, you, apart from saying that you know, that was very, you were a brilliant politician's answer by not answering the question. <laughs> On the other hand, the, the, what you, the importance of diversity and inclusion in this is is so huge, and it's a it's an enormous topic in its own right, as as I think we're all increasingly aware. But um, but thank you for for introducing it at this at this point. Really important. Jürgen, last thought from you. Where does where does Made Smarter go from here? Well, it, it seems to me that. We 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 really are at 
an existential point in terms of the future of our of our industry, particularly, but indeed of our economy. Um, and and the the crisis of COVID um, has just shone a light on that. The existential moment was there anyway, but the crisis has really shone a light on it. And that is to decide whether we're going to carry on, you know, just sort of letting free markets uh, take hold of what we want to be, bumble along, and the market will do whatever. And invariably, the outcome will be whatever. And it will be that we continue uh, to have an economy uh, which is not balanced. And particularly in the northern regions, uh, there will be too many uh, low paid jobs. Or do we grab this moment and create a proper industrial strategy? one that we haven't done for at least 40 years, define the renewable green economy sectors that we want to invest in, create the transitioning schemes in terms of skilling existing workforces and future workforces, and create a future vibrant industrial revolution, which will drive prosperity um, into the decades to come. That's the moment we're at. And obviously, you know where I'd rather go. It's the latter. <laughs> Jürgen. Hayatun, Jürgen Meyer, Hayatun Silem, thank you both very much. Um, really inspiring thought to end on there, Jürgen. Thank you for that. And, and thank you, uh, Hayatun, for your introducing a, a theme that perhaps we should have introduced earlier into our conversation, but nonetheless, uh, uh, I mean, a, a real importance there. Um, that's let, it. Let, let's come back to it in q and I think we should Q&A. Q&A &A starts in 15 minutes at 11 o'clock. Back here. See you then. What a massive pleasure. What a fantastic conversation, and all very close to my heart. So my key takeaways with that is that we, by which I mean industry, needs to be able to respond rapidly to unexpected change. Digital transformation is only successful when it's accompanied with operational and cultural transformation. We need to look at more people-focused, more empowered ways of working. Continuous and accelerated change calls for continuous and always on learning and skill development. We need to find new ways of collaborating across departments, levels, companies, sectors, and that's the road to success, a successful, sustainable future. Yeah, and I, I think I agree that now when the pressure is on, this is a unique moment in time when leaders can try and test and learn and improve more sustainable ways of doing things. And with that, I'm going to hand you over to the Q&A, which starts at 11 o'clock, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.